So for the third talk, it's on uh, mining for causal relationships, a data study, a data-driven study of the Islamic State. And who have we got? Oh, there you are, sorry. Oh, Paolo, oh, great. Thank you. And we'll... Okay, uh, first I'll start with a little bit of motivation. I'm, uh, I'm Paulo Shikarian from Arizona State University. First, let's talk about uh, the target application here. So the Islamic State, as we all know, they've had a lot of success in mounting conventional military operations, military operations using infantry guys, where they've been able to take over cities in Iraq and Syria. But at the same time, they also maintain a substantial a capability to conduct terrorist-style attacks as well. Likewise, they have a lot of senior leadership, such as uh, El Duri here, who was uh, killed a couple months ago, who have a lot of experience in conventional operations. But again, they've been able to re uh, recruit seasoned terrorists uh, with experience in counterinsurgencies uh, the world over as well. So. They are conducting operations in different ways, and they have experienced leadership who uh, have ideas across a spectrum of military operations. So the goal of our study was to understand a couple key aspects about the Islamic State, such as how are they able to coordinate activities across multiple countries? They're doing operations in Iraq and Syria at the same time, and lately they've started with uh, countries such as Libya. How are they reacting to airstrikes? How are they switching between uh, terrorist and insurgent tactics? And also, how do they make effective use of their forces while at the same time causing adversaries such as the Iraqi army to become less effective in how they use their forces? So previous work, uh, several papers that came up um, over the last uh, decade or so, have looked at the problem of studying terrorist and insurgent groups by learning causal rules. I'm sorry, learning uh, association rules. Now, these rules often have a probability associated with them, but the algorithms for these, as many of us are aware, uh, could potentially learn uh, coincidental uh, correlative relationships. Now, the previous work has addressed this issue by getting the input of domain experts to get an idea as to which rules are potentially spurious and which ones are important that we should focus on. However, that may not be sufficient with the Islamic State because they're so different from any previous terrorist group, in, in just for the reasons I mentioned before, where they can go do a conventional military operation one day and a terrorist strike the next. So in today, we're going to look at how we combine ideas from causal reasoning with probabilistic rule learning to get a feel for how this group is conducting operations. So again, I'm Paulo Shikarian. I'm the director of the Cyber Socio Intelligence Systems Lab at Arizona State. Uh, this is work done in conjunction with some of my students. So, uh, previously, we introduced this idea called APT logic, annotated probabilistic temporal logic, and it was a logic-based programming framework to uh, describe uh, primarily social systems, and we were combining uh, probability annotations along with temporal annotations in a single framework that we did not make uh, Markovian assumptions. Uh, example of uh, how this was used in the past, suppose you have an enemy doing reconnaissance of a site before a terror activity, and we can learn rules such as this. Maybe if there's vehicle or foot surveillance in the previous uh, time period, then there's maybe an attack with a probability of 0.85 in the next time period. Now, a couple things these rules can be used for. First, we can take these rules and we can use them in a deductive inference engine to draw conclusions and make predictions about what will happen in the future. Uh, as I said before, the rules may be interesting in their own right. They might help describe the social system and show relationships we may not have been aware of. And a third use is they can actually be used as a way to generate features um, and use then a machine learning type approach to do prediction. 
However, there's, reason, there's, uh, there's some issues with all of these. If you're looking to create a knowledge base for a deductive uh, inference algorithm, you're going to learn a lot of rules, especially when you're dealing with probabilistic rules. So what rules should you use? Uh, likewise, when you're uh, looking at the rules manually, uh, which rules should you look at? Which are causal versus correlative? And you could potentially learn an awful lot of rules. So this becomes important as what do you present your analyst? And finally, which preconditions are most important if you're going to use those preconditions as features in a machine learning approach? So our intuition is for a, a given rule, we're going to compare it with a set of related rules that all have the same consequence. So we compare all these preconditions together and we examine which ones are uh, most often leading to a significant increase in probability of the consequence. Then we, we compare, we use a measurement to, uh, to compare the, all these rules together and this is sort of a value added for a given precondition. And we're leveraging ideas here taken from the work of Kleinberg and Mishra introduced in their UAI paper back in 2009. So here's an APT rule. We have if the cause occurs, uh, C, then G, the consequence occurs in one time step with a probability P. And we say that rule R is a prima facie causal rule if at least uh, G occurs at some point in the historical data. C occurs before G at least one time, and P is greater than the prior probability of G just occurring by itself. So this is all pretty straightforward. The prima facie uh, causal rule gives us a starting point. So it's a very uh, you know, rudimentary step here. So for each rule, we have related rules. So for rule R, R prime is related when it has a different precondition, so C prime, and we have at least one time period where both C and C prime occur together and are followed by the consequence by G in the next time period, time T plus one. And we use this notation here to denote the set of related rules for rule R. So given R and a set of related rules, or in a given related rule, we generate the following comparison rules. So here we have both preconditions occurring at the same time, and we compute this probability here. And then we have the precondition where the rule in question, where that uh, precondition does not occur, but the precondition of the related rule does. And we compute this probability as well. And we use these numbers uh, in, uh, in these following measurements. So first we have epsilon average which was introduced by uh, Kleinberg and Mishra. And this can be thought of as the average increase in probability afforded when we have the precondition for rule R. But we can also look at a couple other measurements that we came up in this paper uh, where we look at the minimum probability increase and the fraction of related rules where we had a positive increase in probability. Now, the reason why we use three different measures is we wanted to get a feel of significance here. And another way we can get a feel for significance of these rules is we, could, uh, we can look at how many related rules there are. So if we have a given rule and there's only, say, uh, you know, two or three others that we can say are related, that means there's only two or three other uh, potential candidates that could lead to that effect. Whereas if you have hundreds, we think that we can talk more uh, strongly about the significance. So what we did is we encoded uh, 2,200 combat incidents uh, conducted by the Islamic State uh, from June of uh, 2014 through the end of the calendar year. And these were categorized into 159 different types. Uh, the, this information comes from the Institute for the Study of War, which is a DC-based think tank that has been uh, studying Iraq for quite some time. And so our resolution for time, we were looking at weeks. So if the precondition occurred uh, in week one, then the postcondition followed. And the postcondition we primarily cared about were spikes in a given activity. So we looked at when a given type of activity exceeded the uh, uh, one month moving average by either one or two standard deviations. Uh, so we adapted the uh, rule learning algorithm from APT logic where we added some pruning techniques to increase efficiency. And this was necessary because 
when you're doing these uh, rule by rule comparisons, that's expensive. So you want to reduce the number of rules you're looking at by as much as possible. Uh, but we're able to do these by enforcing some uh, minimum support. Uh, most of these pruning techniques really come right from the association rule learning literature. But the good news is we were able to do this on a, a commodity laptop. So going into a couple of the rules, so uh, these are preconditions for spikes and armed attacks or infantry operations. So here we see that indirect fire in Baji uh, preceded an armed attack, and uh, this was primarily because Islamic State was doing a uh, lot of ground combat in this area. And the fact that indirect fire was preceding the infantry operations, this illustrates that the Islamic State was doing stuff in a very traditional conventional setting. Uh, this is normal uh, tactics to precede an infantry operation with indirect fire. We also noticed there was a second precondition that occurred uh, in tandem with the first, and this was a multi-dimensional uh, precondition where we also had ongoing armed attacks in a specific town of Balad. And the reason why the spike occurred was because the armed attacks in Balad would continue and new attacks in Baiji would start. It's interesting to note that in this second precondition, we also needed to have a VBID, which is a car bomb, occur in the precondition as well. And the reason why we think this showed up along with uh, the Balad infantry operations was because the Islamic State was trying to conduct a terrorist-style operation to distract Iraqi security forces so they don't go and reinforce in the city they're doing their conventional operations. In, likewise, in preceding spikes and car bombs, we've noticed that there is indirect fire and ongoing infantry operations, uh, and then they conduct uh, uh, further uh, car bombs. And we believe this is also for the same reason. They're getting ready to do more infantry operations, and they want to do these car bombs to draw away Iraqi security forces. One of uh, what I thought was one of the most interesting rules was when there was airstrikes by the Syrian government, uh, against Islamic State targets, the Islamic State would have a significant number of arrests occurring. So they would be doing these internal arrests within spaces they control. And our average increase in probability here is, is extremely high. And this kind of puzzled us is why would airstrikes by the Syrian government lead to this arrest behavior? Well, it turns out that if you think about it, the uh, Syrian government, they use less technical capabilities in determining their targets, so they're likely more uh, human intelligence oriented. And we think the Islamic State is responding to the Syrian airstrikes by trying to uh, weed out the spies. Uh, preconditions for spikes and suicide operations, again, this also includes uh, airstrike uh, by uh, this time the Iraqi government, and we see uh, car bomb operations in the precondition. And we think this leads to spikes in suicide operations because now they're shifting from car bombs to suicide because suicide operations are easier to hide. You need less explosives. Where a car bomb, they need to maintain a garage. It leaves actually pretty big signature. And if they continue on with more uh, car bomb activities when there's airstrikes, they're going to be found much quicker and, and neutralized by the airstrikes. Uh, likewise, we also see spikes in regular IED usage, uh, roadside bombs, when there is uh, air operations by uh, coalition forces. And again, we think this is for similar reasons. Roadside bombs, now we're going to a smaller and mo more covert uh, weapon system here. So uh, future work, um, one thing we're looking to do that we think would be really interesting is can we identify uh, sort of where the gaps in information are. Can we identify new things that we want to look at within the data set that if we understand certain things better, they could lead to more firm causal uh, relationships? Also, of course, scalability is a big factor here. Right now, we're looking at things at a weak resolution, and we have uh, a small size data set. As we go to more uh, richer data, uh, scalability is going to be more of a concern. And we 
look to maybe do something more along the lines of a, a map reduced type framework here. Um, exploring other means to determine causality, of course that's always on the table, and as well as examine preconditions that might span more than one time period. Here we're just looking at week one, then week two. Maybe if we can spread out that precondition, we can learn some, uh, again, more interesting uh, relationships. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, so we've got time for questions. Okay. I'm just wondering if you approach employed, uh, deployed somewhere already in some government or something like this. No, it's not. Uh, this was uh, internally funded at ASU, but we have been talking with uh, partners within the U.S. military over the last couple months about this. Any other questions? Uh, I've got a, a quick question as well. Um, I, yeah, I saw the, um, the rule condition around, uh, what was it, uh, Beige, Beige and Bay, the two places, Beidou and Baji. And I was just wondering, um, so is there any constraints on uh, sort of any geographical reasoning? So, uh, and is that an important part of the, could, could be a potentially important part of the logic to try and capture? So we didn't enforce any type of constraints. These two cities are actually in the same province in Iraq. Um, also in the paper, we do look at uh, relationships between operations in Iraq and Syria and when they sh sort of shift focus from one theater to the other. Yeah. So we do look at some of that. Okay, cool. All right, final chance for any questions? All right, and if not, let's thank uh, Paolo once again. Thank you. Thank you.